put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Watchmen Theatrical Cut movie review. This takes place in 1985, although it is not the 1985 we know, and it's not quite the New York that we know. Superheroes, or rather, costume vigilantes, became a thing in the late 30s in this alternate reality, and have since had quite a bit of an effect on various world events. And though costume vigilantes have been outlawed in, since 1977, one or two of them are still active. And when a murdered man turns out to be one of these costume vigilantes, another of the vigilantes, Rorschach, begins to suspect that maybe someone is taking out costumed heroes. And as he proceeds with his investigation, well, let's just say there are some surprises. Now, the... I, s I think that's about what I should really give away of the plot, to not, yeah, to not say too much. This is one of my more requested reviews. You who asked for it, here it is. You, you all know who you are, except that one guy who has Alzheimer's. Anyway, I wanted to do it right, so not only did I get the movie on DVD from the library on loan, I also got the original graphic novel. Yeah, I know, I own neither of them, and I am terribly ashamed. So I read through the 420-ish pages in roughly a month, about half an hour every day, so, you know, 14, 15 hours, something like that. So yeah, how did they manage to fit that into two and a half hours? This which Terry Gilliam, the director of Brazil, and probably the craziest of the Monty Pythons, I'll let that sink in, he called it unfilmable. So, yeah. I'm going to try to make this review as accessible as I can to both those who have read the comic and those who have no idea about the comic. And, as usual, it, the reviews for both those who have seen the movie and those who haven't. Basically, this is about as good an adaptation as we could hope for. The mediums of film and graphic novels are vastly different, and it fits in as much as it could. It's only 2 hours and 29 minutes, not counting the end credits, 36 minutes width, and yeah, it cuts a lot of the supporting cast. I don't mean trims, I mean cuts, like with a scythe, they're gone. And a lot of character background for our main cast is condensed. Some lines of dialogue, some exposition especially, is moved around a bit. I love comic books. And this is really not a criticism, it is just a fact of the medium. They can get kind of exposition heavy, and that's not a good thing for a film. Films are very visual. And, yeah, with those changes, and keeping in mind the, you know, the, the comic is from like 1985, 86, 87, some, somewhere around that. I guess, I think it came out in 86, 87, and the movie came out in 2009. 
and something you might have noticed that happened in between is the ending of the Cold War, because the Cold War is kind of a big deal in this story. So yeah, with all of that considered, it does a lot well. Basically, and this is for the benefit of those who have read the comic as well as those who haven't, when Alan Moore sat down to write this, and if you don't know who Alan Moore is, then I'm not going to speak to you anymore. One of the best comic writers, period. And Watchmen is, of course, one of his most celebrated works, and thus one of the most celebrated comics. Or thus, it is one of the most celebrated comics. When Alan Moore sat down to write this, he wanted, as the Wachowskis did with The Matrix, to defy genre conventions. The Matrix is an action movie that actually gets you to think, and Watchmen is a graphic novel that is much more complex and much, much more psychological and realistic, very gritty, than your average comic book featuring costumed heroes. We have a lot of very nice We, so some of the characters in this are quite similar to other famous comic book heroes. In fact, I think they pretty much all are, and you can't, I, I don't really think you can call it a, a rip-off. If anything, it's almost a parody or homage. We have the, for, for example, one of the heroes, the, two of the heroes are second generation with one of them having been inspired and taking over for the first one, and the other second generation being the daughter. It's two... The, the two... Silk Spectre 1 and 2 are both female, and Silk, Silk, SS2 is the daughter of SS1, and trained from childhood. And I understand, I don't know that much about more classic comics, that this is based on one of the versions of Black Canary, whereas the two versions of Night Owl, where one is inspired by the other, is inspired by Blue Beetle. And what it does is go deeper into this, where we had already read comics where the, the excuse me, the second generation was the offspring of the first generation, this one actually goes, actually I don't know if that was ever explored in, before, but anyway, this one goes in and says, what's it like to grow up groomed for a life of fighting crime? And the comic does a lot more with it than this. I'll get more into that, but yeah, basically the idea is that she's kind of resentful towards her mother. She never had a life of her own. She never had an identity of her own. And the second night owl is kind of trying to measure up to the first one, and he's, yeah, he, he has kind of issues with that, about measuring up, about being good enough. And the, I shouldn't say too much about the rest. I can talk some about Rorschach, my favorite character. And not just of this story, either. One of my all-time favorite characters. He is... He's disturbed. He is not quite well. He speaks in sentence fragments, and I don't think even he even notices, really. It's like he's so isolated from the rest of the world that he forgot what the rest of the world expects of you. If he ever lived up to it. I, I guess he, he really didn't ever particularly live up to the, to the world's expectations, and that's just how it is. He, he, he's very direct in his application of justice. There are numerous broken fingers and bones in his wake, I, I think. And, yeah, he's... Uh, they, they don't really explain it in the movie, not in the theatrical cut anyway, 
but the mask he has kind of changes shape depending on what kind of how the, the temperature and whether or not he's sweating, stuff like that. So you kind of do get facial expressions out of him, even though it's through this ink blot mask. And while the comic, of course, has still images, so every time you see ink blot faces, it kind of does have this effect of being a facial expression. In the movie, they have it sort of more randomly changed shape, and sometimes they don't really feel like it's matching up necessarily, but it's still a really cool visual. Now, and oh, yeah, before anyone gets to... Yes, Night Owl 2 looks an awful lot like Batman, and he uses gadgets and stuff that's quite intentional, I'm pretty sure. Now, basically, the idea here, here, here is to explore, again, one of, one of the genre conventions of comics is that, originally at least, in, in the original ages, like the, the Gold and Silver Age, I believe, comic heroes were seen as ideals. They were who you looked up to. They were who you... They were role models. And this takes that and says, well, what would they really be like? What are they like as human beings? What does it do to a human being to go out, dress up, and beat someone up for doing a crime? And uh, equally interestingly, what drives someone to do that? And it makes us think about the idea of heroes, and being saved, saving the world, and who should save the world, and what does it entail? How do you save the world? Now, as I already mentioned, the Cold War is quite important to this story, central, in fact, and basically there is this, the only character in this you could really call a superhero, Dr. Manhattan. I'm not sure there is something he can't do, technically. He's kind of in control of everything at its molecular level. So he can teleport himself and others. He can make you explode just by, yeah, willing it to happen. There's a bit, this is not a spoiler, where he is like, he curls up a tank like it was, you know, a piece of paper. And he is on America's side. He's, he's American, so he's kind of put the favor in, on, on America's side. And this makes the tensions even greater during the Cold War. And sort of the the tension present throughout the story is the imminent threat of World War III, of the Russians attacking, basically. And you feel like it's a very real possibility. It genuinely evokes a, f a sense of hopelessness. And, yeah, it's, it's not quite as dark as the comic or the graphic novel, but it gets fairly close. I should also say it's not as gray, it's, there, there aren't as many shades of gray in the film as in the graphic novel, and most of that is missed. However, some of the simplifying also kind of makes it easier to walk into without having read the graphic novel. I, I have never watched this without having already read the graphic novel. This is my second viewing, and when I watched it back in 2009, I had read the no graphic novel, I don't know, three or four times already. So, and if you walk into it not knowing, there are things that you're going to be confused by, at least at first. And 
some of it is explained over the course of it, and that's why it's kind of good that sometimes they they do kind of really expose it, to really remind you this is what that is, and this is what this means. Because otherwise you would kind of forget there's a lot of things that in the graphic novel that are just stated. And that's because when it came out, those things were just taken as second nature, and now, it's over 20 years later, a lot of us have forgotten those things. Excuse me. And the film does a really good job of setting them up, and of getting you into this Cold War setting. You really, you believe it, and you feel it. And keeping in mind, I, I was so young when the Cold War ended, I did not actually I couldn't perceive it. I've never lived in fear of, yeah, the Cold War heating up. And I kind of felt that fear when watching this movie and when reading the graphic novel. So that's something that it really does quite well. Now, the... The intro sequence is definitely worth mentioning. Basically, the intro, yeah, the, the opening credit sequence has all these sort of stills. At first they look like stills, but then you see a little movement, and basically what it is, is it's very slowed down of just these major events in America's history that were now affected by these costumed heroes, in one way or another. And it's... And, and some of this is where you really need to either sort of know some of the comic or pay good attention to what is said later, because you're, there are going to be things that you're not going to really understand at first. It, heck, there are so many different costumed heroes just in that opening sequence, you're going to have a hard time recognizing them. One or two of them appear more than once in the opening sequence, and yeah, some with there being so many and you not knowing who you should be looking out for, it can kind of, you might not realize that, oh, wait, right, I saw that guy half a minute earlier. But it's, a, it's an effective opening, and it does a really good job of condensing information that takes up a lot more space in the comic. And again, this is not a negative of the comic. It's simply that when you're reading a graphic novel or a regular novel, you usually don't do it in a single sitting, whereas movies you expect to finish in a single sitting. And thus, they can condense, they, they can be very dense with their information and really flesh out their world. This is, yeah, this is nothing new to anyone who reads books. And films just it can't really do that. But it, it gets a lot of the information in there. You just have to be paying close attention to really get it all. Or you may have to watch it more than once and I wouldn't rule out, if, if you really, if you're going to watch the movie several times and not going to, like, read online what you, you know, what isn't explained in the movie or read the graphic novel, I would suggest, like, pausing it, writing down names and details and just putting it all together at the end of that. Now, the... The, the good thing about, to, to return to Dr. Manhattan, with this kind of, you know, with all these powers, he also kind of, he becomes extremely objective. He's like a, like the ideal of science. He doesn't look at something and feel something. He looks at something and he gathers its data. He, yeah, he sees what he can learn from it. 
and he has a some antipathy for the human race and it's very it's very nicely done it's sort of the the different heroes are kind of different answers to that same question how do you save the world or what is yeah how how would you approach it what it, there there are different ways of looking at the world now one thing that that one thing that you do note with this it doesn't really come as a surprise with it being Zack Snyder that this is an action movie. Even when he did Dawn of the Dead, it became an action movie. It's you know, action horror, but action. Where, you know, compared to the 1978 one, I'm not saying the 2004 one isn't necessarily a bad movie, but he is an action director. And the graphic novel isn't really an action story. It's a drama where the lead characters happen to be costumed heroes, or costumed vigilantes. And with this, he kind of, Zack Snyder does make it more action-oriented. He also really evokes the look and feel of a comic book. Quite, it, it's been attempted in a lot of different ways with varying success. But I do think this is one of the more unique looking ones. And although I admittedly don't feel that that much of the visual here is really that memorable, and it, a lot of it is directly from the comic and frankly with the graphic novel, and frankly, when you read the graphic novel, the, the images stay in your head more effectively than when you watch the movie. So, so yes, he, he does make it feel like it is a comic book, and perhaps that is why he wanted to add more action. Before I comment on how he approaches the action, I, w I would compare the action in the graphic novel to that of Sin City. It's over fairly quickly, and when you think of the movie of Sin City, excuse me, that actually gets that quite well. Excuse me, it doesn't really have an awful lot to the, yeah, the, the action is just over pretty quickly, which is also why I, I hesitate to call Sin City an action film. I consider it a, a crime thriller noir film with action scenes. But anyway, actually, I'd, I'd say the, the, so yeah, my point here is, Robert Rodriguez did do the action as it was in the comic in, when he made a film out of a comic that didn't have a lot of action, because comics, a lot of hero comics do have a lot of action, also a lot of story, but they're, part of the idea is to, to get these, you know, powered, characters fighting each other. And you don't want that to be over really quickly, but the graphic novel here has... I would compare it to the Born, especially the Born Identity Act, actually the entire Born trilogy, where it's very focused and very quick and to the point. Every attack is supposed to end the fight, and if it doesn't, it's because it's blocked. It, they don't really waste time, they don't really beat people up, they kind of, yeah, they, they just seek to end it as quickly as possible, which makes sense. Again, very realistic. And it is surprising that this didn't go for that same style, because that sort of action has, had been getting more and more popular throughout the 2000s, starting you know, the, the mid-2000s or so. Now, that, with that said, the, the action is very typical Zack Snyder, as of, you know, when he did 300. It, it's kind of when, when he does a, an adaptation of a comic book, this is how he does it. 
it has he, he slows the action down some and then he speeds it up and then he slows it back down again. It's been a while since I watched 300 but I seem to remember that it was used a lot in that and I don't know I personally don't think it was too bad in this. It, I should maybe also say I don't personally mind that style. If you do, if that style bothers you, it will bother you in this movie. It's not like he really, you know, doesn't do it at all. It's, that's the way he tries to, that's one of the things he does to evoke the feeling of a comic book on the silver screen. And I, I would say about the action, it's appropriate in amount. I actually... I remembered it as there being more action, or the action going on longer than it did, but really it's, it's quite appropriate. There's neither too much nor too little. And there, yeah, and, and it's not too close together nor is it too far apart either. But yes, the action is drawn out more with, you know, these very choreographed, fast, fights, and they're fairly fun while you watch, although again I would say you don't really remember that much of it afterwards, and that's not because it's so choreographed, because by comparison The Matrix is also quite choreographed, and you know, I can still remember a lot of fights from certainly the first two Matrix movies. It's just, I don't know, I, I, I know what part of it is, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. But first, to finish off on the action, it is also, these characters, as I said, they are real people. And that's also maybe part of why the fights in the comic don't last terribly long, because regular people, even if they train for it, don't stand up and take a beating for very long. It's that's just not how it works. You if you know to be a good fighter, it it doesn't just mean that you can take a lot of punches or that you can take out a lot of opponents. It also has to do with how aggressive you are and if you hit the other guy before he hits you and if your first hit pretty much ends the fight right there or if it takes you a lot of hits. In that case, you're not going to be able to take out that many. And in this movie, they are kind of made more powerful. It's in part that he, Zack Snyder, really wants us to be impressed with... And I don't think it's his ego, I think it's his love for the comic. He wants us to be very impressed with these characters and part of that is to endow them with a certain physical you know, fighting prowess. So they can kind of do these inhuman feats, where in the comic they are very down to earth. And, you know, a fight that in the comic might have two or three uh, adversaries in the movie might have almost ten. And, yeah, that... It takes some away from the realism because in a lot of other ways this still is a very realistic film. And again, it's it's because he really wants to get the fact that it's a comic book. He, he wants to evoke that feeling. And the comic is in some ways a very uh, untraditional. Yeah. Yeah, untraditional, I'll go with that, comic book. As I said, it's, it defies the genre conventions. And doing it like a regular comic book adaptation is doing it a little bit of a disservice. But yes, to get to one of the core elements of this film adaptation, which is very clear throughout, is that Zack Snyder really really loves the Watchmen graphic novel and really wants to do it justice. And part of the... that 
in some ways that's very good. And it's, I am very glad that we got an adaptation that is this close to the original. And I would say that there, there are likely to be people who watch this movie not knowing the graphic novel, who will go on to seek out the graphic novel and also enjoy that. Because it really does, it's, it's a good introduction to it. It's kind of like meeting a friend after he's seen a movie that you're not sure you want to see, and he basically just excitedly, enthusiastically, without you even being able to tell him, please don't spoil the movie for me, he just run through, runs through the entire movie in a sort of Cliff's Notes version. He gives, gives you a lot of plot points and tells you how it all ends and things like that, and it gets you so interested you want to see what else is in the movie, so you go and watch the movie. It, it does, however, also lead to Zack Snyder just... He almost uses the graphic novel as the storyboards, and that can work. It worked immensely well in Sin City, but that those stories were, for one thing, very... One, one thing to note is that Sin, Sin City was adapted from three of the Sin City comics, which were really standalone stories that just happened to take place in the same universe. It's not like one continuity. They have three different characters. They have three different lead characters. Watchmen, however, is one. I think it's called Maxi Series. These, I think it's twelve issues total. And you can't really remove any of that. You can't actually take just some of it. it I don't even know that it would have made that much sense, although it would have led to better films, to do it the Lord of the Rings way, with splitting it up into three movies and doing like four issues in one movie. I, I don't know. It Part, part of the, the problem is the, the novel is character-driven and films a lot of films certainly are more plot driven. I think I, I guess that's kind of the the typical approach to film is to make it plot driven. And this film is also plot driven, I would say. And yeah, that that takes away a lot of that character. Again, you when when you when you have a book in your hands or a graphic novel you're diving into a universe at your own pace, but a movie decides the pacing for you. And, yeah, as, as such, this tries to fit in all of that into this very small package, considering how much there is. And so the film is kind of simultaneously too fast and too long. It's, it's definitely excuse me, too fast for those who, excuse me, going completely blind. If you don't know anything about this, you're going to be pretty overwhelmed with all the new things you're going to have to take in. And again, when you're reading the comic, you can just pause and really think about things. And at the same time, it's also two and a half hours in this alternate reality that doesn't... It's in a lot of ways different from our own. Nixon is still president. He's been re-elected like three times or something. Yeah, he's, he's been re-elected. He's, he's still president in 1985. Watergate never happened, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with it being so faithful, it feels a lot like Zack put all of his energy into getting all the details right, and sort of staging these big events that the movie kind of just goes from one to another. It, at times it feels very staged. It, it feels like someone just trying to redo something 
that has already been done. Zag isn't really doing his own take on the material, he's not particularly adding to it, nor is he really taking that much away. He is just kind of... Yeah, he's... He's just trying to do it as much justice as he can, and that's really admirable, but it's also not necessarily the best way to tackle something like this. And then there's, of course, also the... Actually, I suppose I shouldn't give that away in this. Now, I mentioned earlier that Silk Spectre, the second, is... Yeah, I, I alluded to something there. Basically, the actress, Malin Okerman, I'm, I'm guessing the pronunciation, she's like... She's Scandinavian. I really should know. I'm Danish. I really should know which Scandinavian country she comes from, but... Anyway. Yeah. I haven't seen her in anything else, I don't think. Not particularly. I don't think she was cast for her acting ability. She's kind of a block of wood. With, you know, no... She doesn't have a no nudity clause in her contract. In fact, from what I hear, she doesn't know the meaning of the words. And she, if she's Scandinavian, a lot of us aren't very good at English, so maybe that's it. She appears to have been cast for her willingness to do the nude scenes that... Yeah. And... She is very, very wooden. But to be fair, they do not give her a lot to work with. Kind of... The things that there are about her in the comic, and this is not spoilers for neither version of the story, is that she smokes a lot because she's very stressed What with this, you know, no identity of her own. Her life hasn't turned out the way she wanted it to. And she's pretty spoiled because her mother basically spent all of this time with her, training her, and yeah, and then once she grew up, she you know, started dating Dr. Manhattan, and she's kind of... Yeah, that's not even mentioned in the movie, but the military takes care of her because they don't want him to suddenly stop being on America's side for whatever reason. So, she's used to getting everything, and neither of those aspects are present in the film. She's, she doesn't behave particularly spoiled, I don't know, maybe they thought that she would be too obnoxious, and she doesn't smoke, and this, I imagine, is because, you know, Hollywood movies are trying to go away from having main characters smoke in movies. But yeah, this is kind of unfortunate, it doesn't leave her with very much to do, so that might also be part of it. One thing that does remind me of, however, the comic, like I mentioned, is quite stark, very dreary. And with that said, it does have some standout funny moments, and it's kind of this twisted sense of humor. And the movie does include several of those and they tend to really work. They get the timing very right. I was surprised. I, I had forgotten how well they actually did with these jokes, but it genuinely is funny when it's trying to be funny. Now... The... With this being set in the 80s, the movie references and sets up that it's the 80s with a lot of these nice little effective things where they very quickly, like, they'll have someone you recognize from the 80s. Like, there's a scene where you just briefly see David Bowie in the background, and it's not... There's not really drawn attention to it, but just anyone who knows the 80s is gonna instantly recognize him, and 
it, yeah, it genuinely evokes that. And that's and it's not because he's anywhere in the comic, but it's because it's something that is 80s. You know, well, David Bowie wasn't only the 80s, but yeah, there, there are various things where you say, well, that's the 80s right there. You know, you feel like it's... And, and the Nixon, although the makeup is a little... I'm not going to say on the nose, okay, I said it. I would say the accent is pretty accurate. Uh, having heard some recordings of Nixon speaking, it sounds a lot like him, but it also has a little bit of... It's again, like I said, sometimes staged. It feels like it's someone doing a a little bit of an overdramatic take on it. And it's not only the Nixon, some of the other historical figures talk kind of like a caricature of the way the actual person talked. Kind of like how they would talk if they appeared in a sitcom or something. Or you were doing a joke of it. But the, the production design is quite good, as well as costumes and sets and props. It all looks very, very real and feels very tangible. There are a couple of things that are a bit obviously CGI, but on the whole, you do really feel like this stuff exists. And the CGI, to be fair, is rather good. The effects in general are quite convincing and very attractive, very nicely done in that respect. Excuse me. Now, the... Some of the music is a bit... Too much. I've, Zack Snyder has a bit of a habit of overbearing his soundtracks. You see that in Dawn of the Dead some. When the man comes around, as the world is... If it, I'm not giving anything away. That's like the opening credits scene, I believe. Yeah, when the man comes around in a zombie apocalypse movie. Really. And this one's even more. Excuse me. This one's even worse in that regard. Yeah, that was my cell. The nuclear detonation from Worms Armageddon. Yeah, I'm a dork. Yes, the... Crap. Yes, the music. This one's even worse than Dawn of the Dead. There's a funeral scene, not a spoiler. It's of the guy who dies at the beginning. They played The Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel. Could you be a little more obvious? And just as you ask, he can. Like I said, the movie's about the Cold War. He plays 99 Luftballons. Zack. Zack. I really hope he gets some input on that aspect. And then he uses a lot of music which is referenced in the comic, again showing a lot of reverence, and some of these work really well. I do quite like the opening credits montage with The Times They Are A Changin' by Bob Dylan. And that's in fact the only Bob Dylan song in the movie that is him, the, the original recording of him. There are a couple of others, and they're like cover versions, that was a little disappointing. But yeah, some of the others, they're just way too on the nose, and it feels like... Yeah, a little bit music video, and I guess it's kind of just where you can really see that this is where Zack Snyder comes from. Now... There are times where it feels a little like it's glorifying the brutality. While the comic is quite violent, this actually avoids a lot of the violence in the comic and replaces it with much more 
gratuitous and brutal violence. It's extremely brutal. I've, I read some comments that said that they, at, at the end of the movie they were laughing at how brutal it was because it is kind of, yeah, you do end up having trouble taking it seriously. And again, part of the idea here, part of the idea of the comic is that you should be questioning, is it a good thing to go out and beat up criminals? Whereas the film seems to kind of be glorifying that and be saying, what if we didn't have these guys to go out and beat up criminals? Now, I should perhaps briefly say, I have not watched the Director's Cut or Ultimate Cut, but having read about them, they do appear to add in a lot that was omitted from the graphic novel, as well as add new things which add to character development. So if you have the patience for those, I can imagine that those are more satisfying as far as adaptations that don't omit anything. Now, that might more or less cover it. Now, the there are a few symbols in the graphic novel which show up several times and are interpreted in different ways by the different people who see them. This isn't that present in the film, but it does try to fit them in some. With the notable... Zach couldn't really have omitted the infamous bloody smiley face, and I'm not gonna give away what it's supposed to look like. And the film does fit in some of them, but without characters noticing them and giving their interpretation of them. So it, it loses some more of the nuance there, unfortunately. Now, that... more or less... The zooms in the graphic novel some of where it's the most visual and the closest to being cinematic, and I'm not sure I'd really call it terribly cinematic. It's, it's got great visuals, but again, there is a lot of text, and that doesn't work so well on film. But the zooms in and out, sometimes going extremely far in and extremely far out, Several of those are worked into the film, and they work fairly decently in the film as well. Now... Yeah, that pretty much covers it. I... I will say that while a lot of what is in this film feels like it's kind of crammed in. It feels very rushed to not not like it didn't not like they didn't take their time in making it, but like it doesn't want to linger on much of anything because it has so much more to get to. I will say I enjoyed watching this movie a lot as a fan of the comic who realizes and accepts that these mediums are very different. I'm not going to say that you're wrong if you don't like this as an adaptation. I can completely understand that. And if you, if you haven't watched this movie and you love the graphic novel and you really don't want to see them mess anything up, you probably shouldn't watch the movie. I wouldn't say that it's worth risking that over. I will just say that if if you just kind of would like to see it up on the silver screen, or if you haven't read the graphic novel at all and you're not really into reading comics, but you like the concept of this movie, then I would recommend this movie maybe more than one viewing and maybe, you know, instantly hit the web, do some research afterwards and just kind of fill in the blanks. And, yeah.
yes, I do believe that covers it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.